Welcome to Urbonus Show, everyone. I'm the host Donatos Urbonus, and I'm glad to introduce you an all-star lineup uh, this week with two scoring machines on the episodes. My frequent guest and co-host, the EuroCup champion, MVP of the EuroCup, top scorer of several different leagues, Eric Lane McCollum II. Hello, Eric. Welcome aboard. Uh, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. And also two-time all EuroLeague team member, including a first team selection last year, and also EuroLeague Players Association MVP of the last season, Alfonso Ford Trophy winner, Michael Perry James. Hello, Michael. You got to say everybody's full name, I see. That's your, <laughs> that's your, that's your lane. You go. Uh. <laughs> that's weird. That's weird introduction, yeah. Probably it was a long time ago when you heard that kind of intro. But yeah, Eric McCollum and Mike James are here on the show. And let's just start with Eric, my friend. It's been a while since the last time you've been on the pod. Knowing how disciplined you are, how obsessed about the hard work you are, did you have any like week off during this summer? Uh, not too much. Um, you know, as you get older, you want to stay in shape. Um, you want to keep your things sharp. If you take too long off, I think um, you know, it's just harder to get back into the flow of things. So I just rather just stay in tune, do things to keep the body right and kind of hit the ground running when I get to training camp because you never know what you're going to experience. So for how many days, let's say you stayed out of gym or like waiting room or something? So I did um, about eight days. I did nothing. And then uh, right back to it, um, started lifting and light, like a light ramp up, slowly progressed myself to to get into the flow. I just feel like I hate the feeling of being out of shape and then that that pain, that hurt in your stomach and your chest. You know, I just I don't want to experience that. So I just rather stay in shape. I I like Mike's direction. What's that all about? You're like moving head like this. Cause I didn't take no days off. Actually coach called me like we talked like maybe a week ago and he was like, you didn't take no time off. I was like, nah, I didn't get a chance to he was like, yeah, stop doing stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, he like kind of got mad at me I didn't take no time off so I okay, forgot to, okay. to be honest that's gonna be interesting season then I mean with you approaching it in your best shape uh, let's say and you know talking about Mike I mean uh, I heard that before that Mike listens to our podcast and I, I, I was like what I thought that you know that's dope and I kind of got convinced uh, about that after uh, one of our episodes when Eric made some comments about Mike's height. Uh, probably it was the topic about Jordan Lloyd, Elio Kobo and Mike uh, being on the same backcourt. And I remember Mike tweeting something about it, that he's like six and one without shoes or something like that, right? And, you know, that's when I, I got convinced. And just a random question, why, Mike? Why are you listening to all these podcasts? Or it's just another random thing you like to do about basketball? Because as I've listened to our pre previous podcast, you just... Love to hit the random game, watch some Lithuanian basketball league game without knowing any player on the court and, and just stuff like that. I just like watching basketball, honestly, and just hearing about basketball. I like hearing different takes because sometimes like you got your own like mindset and how you think about it. But then like when you hear somebody else's like point of view, you can like kind of see it. And then maybe that kind of helps you make a better point of view. I don't know. I just like hearing stuff. I like hearing people talk about basketball, honestly. What's for you, it's, let's say, hardest to understand, especially from our side, from European basketball approach, because we kind of have a very different mentality, you know, on, in the way how basketball should be played. There's always that fight, th that clash between European and American basketball school. We have our own narratives, you have your own narratives, and it's kind of always intriguing to have all these conversations with guys from the United States, for example. The one that bothers me the most, I think, is just because it's always about me. Like, like I feel like people, if you don't win, like, a EuroLeague, you're automatically not better than somebody else that has won one, even if, like, he didn't do much to win it. Like, somehow he's better than you. And I don't, I just, that just doesn't make sense to me. I just, I just don't understand that one. Like, you got to get real lucky to win and real, everything got to go good and, like, Obviously, the playoffs is different because normally the best team wins. But then in the Final Four, I mean, Duke could go 0 for 7 the whole game and then he flip up a shot and win. And then, you know, stuff happens. Somebody get hurt during the game and, you know, you just somehow you win. And now all of a sudden that guy is a top five player in EuroLeague just because he got lucky and won a championship. That just doesn't make sense to me. 
that's, that just bothers me. No, I'd have to agree. I think I think that um, that's the difference between NBA and you know playing in the U.S. and playing overseas. I think in the U.S. we can kind of um, evaluate someone you know, based on their individual skills, individual merit. You know what they were able to do with what they had. And I think and that gets lost in the shuffle in Europe. In Europe, people assume because somebody won a championship, it makes them automatically the best. But realistically. They probably had an extremely high budget. They probably had four or five other all year league caliber players and all those things. And, and when I watch the game and I assess things, I kind of look at, you know, what did you have with you on your team? Why was that so impressive? It's probably one of the reasons why I, I love Mir- Miritich. I think he's an excellent player, but I would have picked you to be the MVP. And I said that just because Monaco being in that position, one game away from the final four is something that doesn't happen, something that hasn't happened. And you know, you guys are right there with no home court advantage and just the the tax on your body playing 30 plus minutes a game, you know, creating, scoring, doing so much for the team. So I think as a player, you kind of see, you know, you know, you guys didn't have a 30, 40 million dollar budget. You know, you had a, a modest budget, it was a good team, but it wasn't 40 million. And, and some of those teams with some of those players have that advantage in that aspect. And I think that's where kind of the shuffle gets lost when evaluating a player versus a player on certain teams. Yeah, I see your point, guys, because it's so hard to win the EuroLeague, actually, because if you look at the list of the EuroLeague champions, basically it's the same four or five teams, all these powerhouses, and it's really hard to make the the roster of these powerhouses. So probably it's kind of unfair when we treat players by titles, especially in the EuroLeague, where it's so hard to win it. And it's not, in the most cases, it's not the series of the best of seven, uh, for example. Basically, it's two, two games. And for example, Mike... The last year he was just like three games away from winning the title so if if that's you know the main difference between being the greatest or being just a you know great great player probably is unfair but in europe you know it's it's different we're so passionate about the game i mean you look at all these crowds and it's you know we have this winning culture as for example in lithuania we we have this label as like a basketball country but i would say we're like a winner's country we just like to win we just like to watch basketball when our team is winning so probably that's why you know we kind of judge players by winning something and that's the I mean, hard yeah, part I don't to have understand. A problem with it like i understand what the what the dynamic is and i think like maybe like when you're talking about all-time players i guess like people were so close when you go to all time. That's why people talk about championships when you say like, oh, he might be the best EuroLeague player ever or he's like top five. But like when we talk about right at, at a moment, I think you got to break that down to more like what he does for the team and like his skill level and his individual like characteristics to make the team go instead of just how this guy won a championship with another MB, two other MVP people on his team but he's not as good because this guy didn't have nobody on the team. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. I agree for sure. Before going to our main topic of the podcast, uh, I have to ask this, Mike, about your last, uh, the last time you made the headlines with this previous podcast. I mean, I mean, can you remember your most controversial tweet or take in a way that brought so many reactions, especially worldwide? Or it was the one, I mean. To, to be honest, I feel like I say a lot of controversial things in general, just because I think outside of the box. But for some reason, every time I mention Steph Curry, everybody gets mad and everybody assumes I don't like him. But I think he's amazing. I think he's like, I think he's amazing. To be honest, he changed basketball like seven years ago. Everybody just started shooting threes and playing small ball. Just basically because of, not only because of him, like 75% of him and then like the other 25, the Warriors. And I mean, you know, I I don't have a problem with him. I just, you know, yeah. yeah to be honest, to be honest, I was surprised by the reaction by all these videos, tweets, headlines, and in, in different media outlets. Even by Steph's reaction, I didn't know that. You know, it hit it hit him actually. You know, some some random podcast with two your league players talking about top five NBA players like a regular topic and you can find on every podcast and it somehow it reached him out you know but i was just wondering i mean okay besides all these reactions what what kevin durant 
thought about your take because you said that you had that discussion about your top five ta- uh, picks of the NBA. Did he have any comments? Honest, uh, I haven't really talked to him about it, honestly. When we was talking about it, we kind of didn't get past three or four because we argued about it for a little bit. So I don't think we ever really got to five. Like, I don't think I ever heard his full five. But I know, like, two or three of them we was agreeing upon. And then one, it, it was, we, wasn't, we wasn't seeing eye to eye. And I didn't like it. Or he didn't like it. I can't really remember all the way. But it's he didn't tough. really bring it up. I don't, think, I don't think he cares, to be honest. Like, have the stuff that when people say, like, he replies to tweets and all this stuff. I, don't, I, just, I think he'd just be bored. I don't think he cares, yeah. really. Guys be bored, want entertainment, all that. My my favorite uh, Mike tweet, and this is probably when I like, I was like, I'm gonna start following this dude. This dude is funny. Um, <laughs> it was when you pin something, no discounts on my services. I think every hooper felt that in their soul, and uh, and after that, I just I love that, and I think you got a lot of backlash for that. But it's at the end of the day, you know, you go to work, you do your job, you do what you're supposed to do. You, know, you should be compensated accordingly. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, a lot of fans, you know, don't understand that, you know, like this isn't just basketball for us. Like, obviously, we want to win. We want to do the best we can. But, you know, we got to provide for our families, our kids, and, you know, put ourselves in a position to we can only play so long. Only play so long. Yeah. And, and we American. Our lifespan in Europe is shorter than European. So if I was European, I I could take a little bit less and just stay with the team until I'm 40. But. Yeah. I'm American. They're going to replace me in like, I'm going to get replaced in like three years. It's going to be over for me. You ain't lying. If you could stay in the team for two or three years, you're special. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. That's what I'm saying. So I'm going to get replaced soon. So I got to, I got to get what I can, what I can get it. Yeah. Especially sure. me. You know, they're going to get me out of here as soon as I start being weak. So, <laughs> man, I'm just, I'm just hanging on, man. Every day, just continue to hoop, do what you got to do. But you're talented, man. As long as you keep doing what you're doing and producing, you know, you'll have as many years as you want. Yeah, I believe there were no discounts this summer as well. You know, you signing this ex- extension with uh, Monaco, two-year deal, right? One of the probably one of the biggest uh, deals of the summer with a lot of many, many moves, interesting moves that kind of changed the yearly landscape. So that's what we are going to discuss in this episode. Uh, I asked you guys to rank your top five biggest free agency signings, whether it's let's say mm, the most talented player switching teams or maybe that move changed the team's landscape in the EuroLeague or maybe changed the EuroLeague landscape actually. I mean, it can be uh, everything exclude, excluding uh, contract extensions. So Mike extension with Monaco doesn't count. Misic, Larkin doesn't count. Some other good extensions also doesn't count. And just, just to make sure we're putting this maximum one Monaco signing limit in this conversation, the rule which probably applies <laughs> mostly to Mike. So... So yeah, maybe let's let's we're gonna go one by one from fifth to first uh, pick. Let's say maybe let's start with Eric, right? What, who do you have yeah. in your my first top five? one? My first guy. He's he's not flashy. His game is not pretty smooth, but it's efficient. He gets the job done. Um, Will Clyburn, um, you know, a guy with experience. He's a two way player. You know, he can go guard the point guard, the shooting guard, the small forward, the power forward. He's tall. He rebounds. And he provides something that FS was missing, a consistent, I don't even want to say a third option because I feel like it's disrespectful to him, but a third score because I don't know who's one, who's two, who's three. But when you add in a guy with that versatility and if they potentially wanted to, they could go small with him at the four. They could put him to lock somebody up and he's going to provide that slashing ability. That's something that, you know, I think they was missing a little bit. You know, they had it with Larkin. You know, Mises does a lot of his damage from the perimeter, but with Will, you know, he's great in transition. Easy points there. He draws fouls. He posts up, you know, and he just gets it done. He's going hard, right? You cut him off. He's spinning. And he's getting to that move every time. And, and he's going to be successful with it. And <laughs> they go for it every time, in and out, in and out, hard, right? But he's a guy I really like. And, and to me, he's the best three man in Europe. I'm so happy you said that, Eric. I can't wait to call him out there and say somebody else said the same thing that I said. I'm so happy you said that. That <laughs> <laughs> made me so happy. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have Will as my tough. Uh, okay, I don't want to disclose my uh, ranking, but I have him very high, and mostly because he was basically signed as the life insurance 
uh, signing, I would say, because Efes, they were preparing for the departure either from Vasily Mitic or Shane Larkin. They could both leave for the NBA, for example. And it was kind of a life insurance deal just to have another superstar if anybody from their guards leaves. And they had these late deadlines for the NBA contract, for the NBA exit clause. So they thought that they're going to kind of, you know, insurance them for the future. But it, it turned out to be the, you know, great, great asset, great superstar for this newly shaped big free. And that's a game changer. They were missing that kind of power uh, last season. That's why they're like let's say really league title chances were always questioned during the season and it was hard to find all these uh, additional assets uh, to clinch the title but now with Will Clyburn having Misic, Larkin making all these uh, other moves with Ante Zizic, Polonara I mean that's a legit free peat candidates I mean the probably the biggest title contender uh, for the upcoming season and I remember that this was one of the earliest free agency bombs and it was actually dropped the contract was actually signed before the EuroLeague final I remember it was the day between the semifinals and the finals of the EuroLeague and I was just getting back home to my hotel it was like 12 o'clock at night and I, I got the scoop on my phone I just couldn't find additional confirmations to break the news and one of my colleagues from from Turkey Ugur Ozan Sulak uh, broke the news straight after the final whistle when FS became champions. So it was a huge, huge uh, deal, you know. And finally, he signed for two years. From what I've heard, it's over two million deal. And what's what's funny that if the war didn't happen, if Ceska was still in the Euroleague, he probably have stayed in in Ceska Moscow because they were already working on a contract extension. But you know, happened. You know, situation is different, and he's joining FS, and now. They're just forming this crazy big free with Shane and Message. So it's going to be a huge, huge problem for you, Mike, and, and guys from Monaco. Yeah, whatever. I hate Will right now. I, you just made me not like Will again. Now I think about it. I wanted Will to come to Monaco so bad, but uh, I'm happy for him. It's my guy. I like Will. He's a good guy. You think you had any chance to bring him to Monaco? Because Monaco also made some big moves. Uh I don't know. I mean, I tried to use my friendship as an advantage, but I don't I don't know if we ever really had action or or if uh you know, I'm not in the front office, so I don't know what their action what their interest was or what their the budget for him was or anything of that nature, but uh I would have loved to play with Will again. I mean, obviously we all know how good Will is, so um you know, maybe that was just me uh, you know, just hoping for something right there. But, I mean, uh, I enjoy our team. I think our team's really good. So, we, we got to see what happens when uh, the ball tip up. By the way, the main one of the main questions about Clyburn's addition is how he going to handle his different role in, in FS. I mean, with Misic being a primary ball handler, Larkin being a secondary ball handler, um, taking a huge load on the offense and there is Will. You played with him shortly in CSKA uh, with some other great talents around. Do you remember how he was handled uh, this role and how he can be successful with FS for the coming years? I mean, I think the good thing about Will is he kind of can take pressure off of you and he doesn't need the ball at the same time. He'll go get rebounds. He can push and transition. He can spot up and shoot. He can post up mismatches. So, uh, when we played together, I used them a lot, just uh, one, three pick and roll, see if they make a, a slip up, see if I can get a switch, use him to an advantage, try to get a double just to take pressure off of me. Like uh, having somebody that big that can do so many things and take pressure off of a person like me who gets a lot of attention, it helped me out a lot just because he's just a different type of player. He's a different mismatch. He's harder to guard. He's harder to, it's harder to find somebody to put on him. It's only like, there's not that many threes in Europe that can kind of move like him and are big enough to guard him on the post. So uh, just using him as a as a mismatch and using his his tools and his God-given ability to kind of exploit certain things was huge for us when we actually did get to play together. So do you have him in your top five? What number are we at? Number one. Number one? Oh, yeah. yeah, he's number one for me too. Yeah. 
Good choice. Oh, we're starting from the number one? Oh, that's what I was. I can switch ah, it up. Okay, because he's also my number one. Yeah, oh, because I, I thought that if he's your number five, who's going to be number one? No, I'm he's like number surprised. one. He's number yeah, one. Okay. <laughs> okay, then. My we'll number five is a, is a sleeper. I got a sleeper at number five. I can't lie. Okay, I let's just let's, made let's, this up right now. Like, but, but <laughs> I'm excited to get to my number five because nobody is <laughs> anticipating this. Let's keep this intrigue uh, for the end. So, okay, number two. What do you have uh, for your number two, Eric? So for my number two, um, it's a guy who really blossomed and matured to me. Uh, when he first came over to Europe, um, he was more offensive-minded, um, didn't really pay much attention to defense, didn't really know how to use his teammates. And throughout this year, he left the NBA, came overseas, and took a leadership role in Unis Kazan, Mario Hazonia. Um, he's exactly what Real Madrid needed. They couldn't score you know, in the final. The offense was disgusting. Um, just watching it, like, they couldn't create nothing. You know, it wasn't Pablo Lasso's fault. It was just guys couldn't make shots. Guys couldn't create space consistently. Guys couldn't get in the pick-and-roll spots. The bigs did an excellent job. Tavares was a monster. Um, the bigs were doing their job inside, but they just – didn't get that guard play that they needed. And I think with Hazonia, even though he plays the three position, if they allow him to get free, he's big, he's strong, he can shoot, he can post. Yes, he will take some difficult shots, but I think, you know, normally in that Real Madrid system, the up-tempo flow, he'll have that freedom. And I think it's time that they kind of, the older players pass the baton. You know, you had your time, let a younger player kind of take some of that stress off you. So you're still going to be a big time player. You're still going to, you know, command a lot of attention, but it's nothing wrong with passing over the keys to another dog. And I think now he's ready. You know, first time in Barcelona, he was just so young. But now what I've seen from him this year, I mean, he he was going to work and he had Unix in position to make the playoffs. By the way, talking about Real Madrid, uh, we saw so many guards, scorers, point guards, switching teams or returning to EuroLeague. And Real Madrid, they signed Chacha. Sergio Rodriguez, I'm not sure about his role for the upcoming season. He might be a backup or he might share the same kind of, you know, load like he did in Milan, which is good. But me personally, I kind of expected Real Madrid to make some big moves, either for Wilbekin, either for Mike, for Sheik. Uh, were, were you surprised that they kind of stayed with, with kind of similar backcourt like they did uh, they did have uh, the last season? Or Mario Hezoni and now he's going to, you know, embrace this perimeter star, uh, perimeter uh, facilitator uh, role uh, in the upcoming season? I think they're in a tough spot. It reminds me of the Olympiacos days when Spanulis was towards the end. You know, you got a guy who's so highly touted. You kind of want to respect him and do him the right way, but you know that the team is not the same running the offense through him. And I think um, Sergio Lewis had a great career. He's been a great player. He still has moments. It's flashes but he can't consistently do it over the course of the entire year elite season. Um, same with Rudy Fernandez. These guys are great players. You know, I respect their game, but a uh, father of time is undefeated. And I think they're trying to find a way to gracefully, you know, move them into the sunlight without disrespecting them, you know, and I, I applaud them for doing that because they've done so much for that organization. But a lot of times Spanish teams don't sign um, American players unless they have a passport. So it makes it extremely difficult just because of the ACB uh, rules, how they kind of want to manage things. Spain is in a place that always carries a lot of Americans. And some of those other countries, like you said, like um, those Turkish places, um, France, uh, Italy, Greece, they always carry more Americans who maybe aren't passport holders of a, a European country. So I think that by them signing Herzogna, they were saying that we're going to give him a lot more responsibility. We've seen he could handle it with Unix. I think a supporting cast will be better in Madrid. I mean, he already has a guy like Tavares. He can play off of him. But I also think that to get guys like that is expensive. And they have expensive Spanish players. And they kind of don't want to get rid of them. So if you want a Mike James, if you want a Scotty Govacan, you're going to have to pay. And then you have to kind of give them the ball to do what they do. You don't sign a guy, pay them that money, and take away who they are. So I think a lot of times teams sometimes go with less. Not to say that those guards there aren't good, but they're not capable of what a Scotty or Mike is able to do so you kind of can kind of fit them into your system so maybe you'll take a guy who's a little bit less talented but you can control him and he can run your offense and I think that's what you see from a lot of Spanish teams with a lot of their signings um not just Real Madrid look down the line with a lot of players is guys who don't deviate from the system too much 
Yeah, I remember as soon as I saw news about Lorenzo Brown and Spanish Basketball Federation working on the Spanish passport, I thought that it was clear he's about to join Real Madrid. So he kind of surprisingly for me went to Maccabi Tel Aviv. I mean, talking about this passport thing, I mean, if he if he was, you know, one of the candidates, I don't know, maybe you guys were also in the con- consideration of the Spanish Basketball Federation, but just, just to make things uh, real, were you surprised about this about this uh, situation? Extremely. Lorenzo? Um, it's, a, it's a no-brainer. I mean, if he gets that passport and Lorenzo Brown counts as a Spanish player, I mean, you have to take him. But, you know, maybe he, you know, got a better offer earlier from Maccabi. I know he'll have more freedom. I know he'll be more comfortable. I know he'll get to play his game how he sees fit. And I know he won't be playing 20 to 22 minutes a game, which is what a lot of Spanish teams do. He'll get the ball. He'll be the leader. And I think... uh You know, he'll have that opportunity. And if he plays well there, he can always go back to Spain. You don't have to rush there. You have that passport now, so you have time. What do you think, Mike? Uh, the spa- the passport thing didn't bother me as much. I, th- I thought that once he got that, which is big for him, I mean, that's big to play to a, a Spanish team that has a lot of history and is going to be good because Spanish players are normally good. Um, that would have made sense to go to Madrid, but Um, I don't know if he gets the ball full time in Maccabi. I mean, they did sign Wade, so I, I'm I'm curious, honestly, how Maccabi is gonna fit both of them in. They're kind of similar in how they play a little bit. They're both kind of downhill. They're both not really three point shooters. They're more like pull up mid range guys. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious on how they both play them with Hilliard and Holland. It seems like they have a lot of guards over there, perimeter players. So, uh, but I think picking up picking up Hilliard and Hollins is big just because they both can shoot. They're both considered shooters. So, uh, yeah. obviously, the two guards are downhill. So, I think that's going to be interesting. I don't know how much they play together or how much they play apart or how they work their whole dy- dynamic. I'm interested, though. They're both exciting. I thought they would both go to their own teams, but you know how that goes. I would play Wade off the ball more just because I think Lorenzo is a better creator. I think he's a little better in the pick and roll. I think Wade is, he can create, but I think he's better in a scoring situation where Lorenzo can kind of, like, at least what I saw this year, he was one of the top assist guys. He kind of orchestrated the offense, you know, outside of Hazonia, you know, without him, he was kind of the centerpiece of what everything, how it went, the motion, how everything kind of connected. So it's, it could be tough just because of the lack of shooting, but Hillard was crucial for them signing because he also doesn't need the ball. He can get busy with the ball if needed, as you saw in Munich. But I've seen him in a lesser role at Cheska with you guys. And, you know, he played the pin down spot up shot role and, you know, seemed to do it well. Stayed there two years. You know, don't know if he liked it or not, but, you know, the team <laughs> thrived and he did well. You know? <laughs> I don't think many players <laughs> like using 50% of their game, but, you know, the team was successful. Hey, Mike, how are you guys going to handle the ball in, in Monaco with Jordan and Ellie joining the team. That was that was a surprising move by the management, actually, to bring all these three great, great scorers, great gar- guards on the same team. Um, to be honest, because I knew kind of both about them before, obviously, most people did. I, I was a little skeptical at first because, I mean, uh, I know Jordan kind of, not really as much, but and I don't know Ellie at all. Well, I didn't know Ellie at all. And so uh, when it first happened, I was a little skeptical on how it was going to work. I feel a lot better about it now after talking to both of them and, you know, seeing how, like, seeing their views on what's what's going to happen. Um, I've worked on my off ball a little bit more because obviously, uh, you know, they both are good and they need to have the ball too for us to be successful. It can't just, you know. It can't just, you know, me being stubborn and just taking the ball. So uh, I think it's just going to have to be a little bit of sacrifice from everybody, just in general. Just how every season is, if, if people aren't sacrificing, then it's not going to work. So it's just going to be a little bit more sacrifice, a little bit less time for each of us with the ball in our hands, and, you know, making a couple extra passes. It sounds so easy, right? Just sacrificing some things, you know, just playing more off-ball. But how? what it really takes, you know, for you guys as a scorers to be more of off-ball players, to have these great scorers or ball handlers around you? Either it's you or, or let's say, Maccabi and Wade Baldwin, Lorenzo Brown, some other teams. Um, 
first of all, it's a mindset. I think the mindset is basically how you get through it in general. I think if you come in thinking I'm going to get mine and I'm going to do what I need to do, that's kind of like, you know, that's putting yourself above and then that's probably not conducive to winning. So I think uh, me personally, I'm coming into it just ready to find out where they like to score at, how they like to score, how I can help them since I'm a little bit older than both of them and I've been around a little bit longer. So how I can help them, how I can teach them and how we can learn from each other and just uh, see how we can all be conducive in one area. And sometimes, obviously, it might be needed for us to all three play together. So we have to learn how to do that. Uh, obviously, we're going to play a lot with just two of us. So we need to learn how to do that, even without me on the court and with me. So, you know, just uh, figuring each other out. I think that's what preseason is big for. Uh Obviously, Ellie's with uh, the French national team, so we'll get him a little bit later. But uh, just figuring each other out, communicating, and just, uh, you know, figuring out spot. What I do like, uh, what Monaco did, is Ellie, multi-year deal. You, multi-year deal. So there's no pressure. We go out there. We know we're appreciated. We know that they like us here. We go play our game. Our only job is to win. I've seen Jordan Lloyd, you know, playing a system where, you know, I seen him when he was in Red Star, where he was, you know, getting loose, getting a lot of shots, you know, ultra aggressive. And then I seen him more controlled in Zenit. And so I know for a fact he can play off ball with the ball. And, you know, he really started to mature in his game and growth um, in creation, playing the pick and roll, finding guys. And I know you, you just want to win. And I think, um, you know, like we discussed earlier, um, you're a guy who already brings those talent bowls, that talent those characteristics. Now you're not going to have to do as much. And I think it was easier for you to do that in that Olympiacos series, you know, just watch it. You had to do so much. Every other day was the game, travel, play 35 and 30. It seemed like every time you came off the court, the offense couldn't function. Um, there was no creation. There was like, and I think when you experienced that, you know, this, this is just me talking from my point of view, when you experience that, because I've been in a situation where I've been on teams like that, where I've had to do everything. You, when you get help, you're like, you're thankful, you know, it, it preserves your career, preserves your body and allows you to be stronger, not just, you know, in the fourth quarter, but at the second half of the season. And I think um, that experience was good, you know, just to go through that and to see like, okay, I'm good. You know, I was able to do a lot, but if I had one or two more with me, you know, I could really, really make a, a difference, you know, in, in this elite eight run and maybe a championship run. And I think that's what you see here now. Jordan Lloyd defends, he can guard the three. You're strong. You know, you could guard one or two. That's not an issue. Um, it's going to be, you know, getting you guys flowing off of each other, playing with each other. I think crunch time lineups, I think that's the three I run with. You know, I won't run that for a long period of time, but I think last five minutes of the game, four minutes of the game, that's what I'm running with because you got three guys who can create, who can dribble, who can play pick and roll, who can shoot, who can ISO. And now it's just going to be, y'all just going to have to D up. And I think now since you won't have to carry such a large offensive load, I think you guys will have more energy to play defense. Yeah, I agree. Honestly, I'm excited. I'm excited to see the dynamic and just how it goes. Everybody seems excited on our whole team, to be honest. Yeah, yeah and I, I love that Monaco tries to, you know, to go that different path, to, to take that different path. Even the last season, they decided to bring you in September, Will Thomas, Bacon. They made some very interesting in-season adjustments. Now bringing Okobo, Lloyd next to you, some other great uh, additions. I mean, that's how the, let's say, middle budget Euroleague team should work, you know, to take some risks, to take some brave, interesting decisions, because if, you, if you're if you going to try to play like all these powerhouses, you're going to lose on the court uh, just because of the level differences, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to beat them, it's hard to create these old Cinderella stories. And I believe it's going to be very hard for you guys to repeat the success of the last year, because probably it's always easier to surprise everybody in the first year, but to be consistent on the highest level, it's tough. And especially with this EuroLeague, we see so many teams improving their rosters, investing even more in, in bringing great, great players. Partizan joined the tournament, Virtus joined the tournaments. All the other teams like Fenerbahce did some great rebuilding moves. It's going to be tough, but but yeah, you took a different path and it's, it's going to be exciting. Without, you know, it's hard to predict where you can see your team, actually. You can see them fighting for the playoffs, but maybe you can see them fighting for the final four uh, just like the last year. So it's it's going to be great. And I'll tell but, you what, John Brown on that backside, 
he gonna make y'all defense a lot easier because that boy is everywhere. Bet the best pick and roll defensive player in Europe. It's not even close. I think him and uh and Dante too is gonna be an athletic four or five that on defense it's gonna be hard to get by. Mm-hmm. Dante's kinda everywhere too, real athletic, jumps a lot. Blocking everything, no layups down there. <laughs> That's gonna be did a you, tough uh Mike, did you have Hezonia on your top five? Actually my number four is Bielicha. I mean my number two is Bielicha. Okay, okay. Can you explain why? Reasons why. Um, last time we saw him, obviously he was MVP. And he kind of got, to a lesser extent, some kind of Clyde burn in him. Like he plays with the ball a lot. He's tall. He's, he shoots from far. He's kind of difficult to find a matchup for him. And he's playing for a Tudis. And a Tudis, if you don't know, exploits mismatches a lot. And he puts dynamic players in places to make them comfortable and to make them be able to utilize what they do well. So I think he'll be in a lot of spots where he'll be able to take advantage, have mismatches, mismatches and be in places where he feels comfortable. And I think for somebody who's that good and just kind of dynamic and kind of a tough matchup to find for, I think he can find his niche in that role. And I think, I think he's going to play well, but I mean, you know, the season always brings something different and it's always hard coming back from the NBA to Europe to, to figure out your feet. But I think, uh, the two, is going to give him a lot of responsibility. I think he's going to get a lot of, uh, just, you know, spaces to operate. And I think he'll have a lot of, you know, areas. Yeah. I, I've heard that. I mean, it's one of the most surprising signings probably. And I know that Many NBA people were also surprised as well. I mean, we saw some reactions from Warriors players because, you know, Bielisa could be a good fit in the NBA team, you know, NBA champions team. He was great, but from what I heard, you know, he was homesick. He just wanted to return uh, to be important because we remember him as a playmaker. Maybe in the NBA, he's more of a stretch guy, you know, stretching the floor. In the EuroLeague, he was like, you know, doing everything on the court. So he just wanted to return and it was about time to return because he's turning 34, I guess, uh, during the season. So he he wanted to keep some of his best years remaining uh, in the EuroLeague for the title contender team like Fenerbahce is. So that was a surprising signing. I don't have him on my top five, but for sure it was a great, great move by Fenerbahce. I like that. 34, saving some of his good years. Yeah, that's my <laughs> age right there. Still a lot of good years left in that body. He was actually my number three choice. Um, anytime you're skilled and you play the three or four and you're big and you're, you're automatically a mismatch just because usually guys who are taller, who are athletic, who can move, you know, they're usually an NBA. So there's not a lot of guys who can check you. So um, even at 34 years old, you know, he was playing, you know, in the best lead in the world. You know, he's a guy that can create his own shot. You know, you could even run some little pick and roll actions with him. You know, they have a smaller guard. I would even put him in a situation sometimes where he's the ball handler and you're screening with a smaller guard, forcing that switch. Guards aren't really good on pick and roll defense. They don't know whether to hedge, you know, they get in the way. You know, you got him in post-up situations, pick and pop situations, have him screening for Scotty. Scotty shoots the ball so well. If you hedge, he's going to be wide open for three. I mean, there's so many ways that, you know, like Mike said, the Tudis will be able to use him. And so me, he's, he's my third guy. You know, I know he's been away from Europe for a while. I'm probably not used to the practices, um, the grind, uh, the commercial flights, you know, luckily your elite union allowed you to get your own room. So, you know, that he won't have to experience, but it's going to be an adjustment coming from NBA life back to Europe, you know, just talking with my brother all the time about it. Like I laugh about it. Some of the stuff just because it's Europe has improved immensely, but it's just so different between the NBA and, and, and Europe. And even for the star players so but i think uh, he's a guy that you know, will adjust this because he's been here before and he's a special player and he's in a basketball uh safe haven you know and it's the more they love hoops fans support is going to be great you know fin about your players get respect so you know i think he's going to have a tremendous season i have another from the Bakcha guy on my top five but i will start with my number two selection and basically he became a number two selection just because of the way he joined the team. And if you're head coach 
of the Yurlik powerhouse risks to meet you in the restaurant during some very good level domestic league playoffs. And if he, he takes you over one of the best point guards in the Euroleague, I mean, he has to be good and he it has to be a tremendous signing. And it's, of course, I'm talking about Tomasz Satoransky, you know, joining Barcelona. And even though they had Nikolaitis under contract for another year, Shades made this move. And that's why I rate this move so high because it seems like that Barca plays all in with this move because uh, they're letting go Kalaitis, who was star player for this team, who made a lot of good things for this club, but they just didn't believe in him anymore. They brought Satransky. Sharuna Sisikavich is on a contract year, expiring year. He's making big moves, switching Brandon Davis with Jan Vesely. He's bringing some other guys. It seems like for me that they're playing all in. Satransky is a bit different than Kalaitis. I think Kalaitis is a better creator and defender. Satransky, uh, maybe he's a better spot up shooter. Uh, he's tall, he's over two meters, but he's not as good as in defense as Kalaitis, but maybe he's a better finisher. So maybe they will try to improve their offense by this way. But I mean, all the conditions, how he joined the club, I mean, it was scandalous and maybe even underrated here in Europe because it's so rare to see these deals happening during the very important time of, you know, big time teams like Barcelona and especially when they lost the Spanish league finals against Real Madrid. So I'm not talking about the level. I am not sure if Satoransky will be that missing piece for Barcelona to win the title. Of course, there are high hopes for them, you know, to be a, to make a good connection with Jan Vesely. They're both great friends. They both led Czech Republic national team in, let's say, historic heights in international competitions like World Cup, Olympics, uh, Eurobasket. Uh, and of course, when you have two most important positions on your team being good friends like Sotransk and Vesely, it might take you to somewhere. But of course, that's a big risk. And it seems like that Jesikavichus and Barcelona, they are taking uh, risks for the upcoming season. So for me, it was a huge move because at first I thought that Kalitas is staying, but it had turned out that he's gone. And, you know, all these deals were made behind his back and in some restaurant during some very important time of the season. I'm not a believer. So what do you like about <laughs> his game? What do you like about his game? Hey, that's a question to Sharuna Siskavichus, not me, not me. I like I'm the way curious. he was playing. Yeah. He does. Okay. Is it safe to say he's not a great shooter? Is it safe to say that? He's not a consistent shooter. He's a not better consistent. shooter than Kalaitis, but he's inconsistent. Is, is he the playmaker Kalaitis is? Uh, it's hard to be as good playmaker as Kalaitis is. He's okay. not as good Nobody. creator. So, he, so he's not a good enough playmaker as Kalaitis. He's not as good a defensive player as Kalaitis. So what is he going to do in a system where things are handcuffed, where you have to do exactly what the coach says? There's no freedom. You've been in the NBA for the last, what, five, six years? And now you're coming handcuffed and you're playing in a half-court offense where you have to run the set. And he's a guy who's fast and who's athletic, who needs a transition game. How will he fare in this system? I'm not saying he's not a good player. I just don't see the fit for him to be as successful as he can be. Will the team win? Of course, it's Barcelona. They always win. They have one of the best coaches. But his style, I just feel like it kind of, it bumps heads with what Sarunas wants to do. So, I mean, it would be interesting to see, um, you know, if he can improve that jump shot to make it more consistent, if he can, you know, find a way to exploit his athleticism. I mean, we've seen it. Dante Exum. You know, very similar player, you know, did not look like that high lottery pick that he was, you know, and I'm just, I just don't see the fit, but I, I hope I'm wrong. And, you know, if I'm wrong, I'll be the first to admit it, but I just see an average season for him in a system that doesn't really fit him. I think that uh, he fits I the think system. Like, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Sure? I just think that he fits the system. Of course, way better than Dante Exum. I think that Stransky is more like a systematic player, like Shulna Siskiewicz just likes. Uh, he's that tall point guard. I mean, he's a good creator. Not as good as Nikolaitis because it's, it's hard to find any you know anybody who can match Kalaitis in creativity. But he he's a floor general, like like we saw him in Czech Republic, for example, in in let's say European basketball size court and everything. And if I I just believe that I mean Shadas can make a good point guard 
from anybody, like Thomas Volkop. He joined Jalgiris as a wingman, as a shooting guard, small forward at first. He turned out to be a point guard for that team and he made that leap to Olympiakos, you know. So having Satransky's skills, having his size, Shadas just loves big, big, tall point guards. Uh, who are, but in you know, Zagiris, in Zagiris, Thomas Walkup, he was solid, but he averaged eight points, three assists, seven points, three assists. Is that a great season? Uh, it was not all about stats. I mean, he was giving more than stats. I mean, he's I know, an all-around player. When you play somebody millions of dollars, you're going to want them not only to just win, but you want them to impact the game, I think, too. Um, I think he's solid. Don't get me wrong. I think the, bus, the most success Sronis had was usually with guards who could shoot. I feel like Misic didn't really get out of his shell with him because he needs freedom. As soon as he left and got freedom, he became a different player. Um, Kevin Pengos was really good with him, but he's a good shooter and he's able to play in that system. He was really good in Zenit. You know, he's a guy that, you know, could kind of do that type of thing. And, you know, I, he struggled early on that first year, but that second year he was much better. But I'm, I'm curious because most of the guards who go with Sarunas, they struggle because it's, it's tough. He's demanding. He was a great point guard and he expects the world out of you and you have to be mentally, physically strong. I mean, there's a reason why, why Kevin Pangos didn't return to Barcelona. Two great years, Zagiris, Final Four. Barcelona comes with the bag and he doesn't go back. Isn't that weird? I think he, he left Barca because of some uh, conflicts with Coach Pesic. Wasn't that the reason? And then uh, no, later I it was just too late for Barca. Or are you talking about right now? I'm talking about right now. Uh, Wouldn't you go back to your old coach who you went to the final four with, who you won, it, was successful it, it, It's with? a tough situation because, you know, he had a deal with CSKA Moscow at first. So it's, you know, it, it was different for agency for him and Barcelona, I think. But I agree with you. I mean, when I saw them signing Satransky, I was surprised because I just, at first I didn't believe that he's about to replace Nikolaitis. Some people were talking that, oh, Shadows just likes to play two big time playmakers, you know, tall guys on his lineups. And I was like, okay, okay, let's let's see what it can, you know, do about it. But when he's replacing Kalaitis, he has, as you mentioned, kind of the same limitations as, as, Kal as Kalaitis did. So yeah. I completely agree with you that Kevin Pangos type of player would, would be been perfect. best fit for Shumas' couch. Yeah. So yeah, in a way, I was surprised, but just talking about the whole outside no noise, all the outcome, moving out your, you know, one of the star, biggest stars of the decade in the EuroLeague, moving out of your team. I mean, it was it was scandalous. So that's why I put him in the top five. I'm not so sure if it will work out on the court, but you know, if, if Shadas is making this move, maybe he knows more than, than yeah. us, something more he than see, us. He sees something that he likes, that's for sure. We'll see. Mike, do you have anything to add? Move, yeah, I think that move was less about Saturansky's fit and more about Nick's inability to fit in that system. I think that's just the wrong system for Nick. Nick needs freedom. Nick needs to run up and down. His inability to hit pull-up jumpers makes him better in transition to where he can get people trying to decide if he need, if they need to go under or over the screen. And then he's the, he's quick enough to get by you with that first step and if he plays in any four on three, five on four situation, I mean, Nick's the, maybe one of the best passers we've seen in Euroleague. So he's going to make a good decision and make a good pass. So when he's in transition, being that tall, being not as slow as he would seem, and being able to make good decisions, he's perfect for a system like that, like he had in Panathinaikos, where we ran up and down and he can pass the people, shooters, he had lob threats. But when you slow him down, you take away half of his creativity. And even though, yeah, you still probably got one of the best passes, him make good decisions. His inability to make pull-up threes at a consistent rate kind of handicaps your offense if you're just going to slow down the whole time. Because then we can wait for him under screens. We can make a decision. Oh, okay, we're just going to go under and Nick's going to beat us instead of in transition trying to make a quick decision. And maybe you go over that time and he gets by you and now he get a layup. Then if he gets a layup, he might make a pull up through because he got confidence now. So I think it was more about his inability to fit in Barcelona's system. And Saturnzi was already had been in Barcelona with Vesley incoming. I think it was just like an easy person just to pick up. I think he could fit better. Maybe he's more prone to shoot and pull up catch and shoot three since that's kind of what he did in the NBA 
maybe he's more ready for a slowdown pace. Who knows? But I don't think, uh, in general, I don't think Saturance is a better like individual player than Nick, but maybe it's just a better fit than Nick because I think Nick was probably the worst fit I've seen in Barcelona. He looked like he was miserable. He looked like he wasn't having fun and having played with Nick for two years and knowing how he is. It just wasn't the same Nick Collas as I'm used to looking at every day. They crack jokes. That's always smiling. That's running up and down the court. They can always get you a triple double. So I think that was just, it was more, it was less about, it's less about Sadoransky's fit and more about that Nick was just the total mm-hmm. opposite of what they needed to me anyway. Mm-hmm. Do you like Nick playing for uh, Etudis in Fenerbahce? I mean, yeah, I think Etudis is less about a system and more about what the players he has and how to make that work. So if he goes to Fener with Bielica and Scotty, two shooters, Nick is going to thrive. I mean, anything up tempo where he got shooters and if they have a lob threat, I think Nick is going to yeah. be. They got a lob threat. I think Nick Devin, is going to be. Devin Booker. Devin Booker, John DeMotley, they, they got the lob threat. Devin Booker is a freak. I on think Nick will be. Is, is a perfect person. And I also think that Barcelona is going to miss a little bit of Nick's defense on on the ball. I think uh, part of their defensive presence this year was that Nick is a good defender and he can kind of muck up the point guard being so tall, being 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. He's bigger than most point guards. He kind of gets in the way. He's got good hands. He kind of makes up for the fact that maybe Miritich doesn't move his feet as well on pick and roll so he can get back. You know what I'm saying? So I think uh, they might miss that a little bit too. Obviously, Corey's a really good defender, so he'll he can kind of cover that. But they kind of saved Corey for wing and put Nick on point guard, so they had two. So I don't know how that dynamic is work is going to work. But obviously, he's a great coach, so he'll figure it out. But uh, yeah, I think Nick will be perfect in Fender if that works out. I don't really know their situation. I try to stay out of my friends' business until they tell me. So I don't really know what's going on. Yeah, so Eric, you mentioned you had Bielitz as your number three. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Mike, what do you have in your top three next to Bielitz and Bill Cleburne? Uh, just Monaco. Just the Monaco signings. I'm going to just put all of them at three and just <laughs> explain why I like all of them. And I'm gonna just, I don't want to pick one individually because I feel like they're showing favoritism. Yeah, just I like John because he's going to bring us energy and he's good for us. I think we needed another defensive presence. Uh, just in general, another smart defender, clever. Mormon adds uh, experience and another person who can shoot, play some post defense, kind of post up when we need him to. Uh, Jerron is just was first team on Euro Cup. I haven't seen much of him play. I tried to watch some highlights and some games of him. He looks pretty solid. He's a shooter. Obviously, Ellie and Jordan, we already talked about. They'll help us out a lot this year. We have a young French athletic person that was that we signed. I think he'll help us out just because adding French players to your roster, especially with, when you have to play domestically, is going to help. And uh, my young fellow, the point guard from Asheville. I don't know how to say her by name correctly, so I'm just not going. I'm not going to mess nobody up. Matthew, uh, I'm right. just going to say. Is it Stra- yeah, Matthew Strazel? Oh, Matthew Strazel. 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 Yeah, Strazel. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the two. I didn't really want to mess it up, but I yeah, like yeah. him actually. He's, he's he plays hard, fearless. So yeah. I think uh, our summer is going to be three for me. I, I was surprised that they brought Matthew uh, because you know I, I was just surprised in general that I mean both Strazel and Vembanyama they were top prospects for Asheville. I mean, it, it felt like, you know, the Asheville is the last team before their jump, they leaped to the NBA. So do you have any clue what happened with, with Villarbon's organization? You know, that they're just letting away two, two of the NBA prospects? I don't, but I like uh, I like that we got Strazil, another French, another French guard that can kind of help us out in French league. Uh, hopefully I can help him out, just mature his game. And uh, one thing I've, notice with a uh, playing against me doesn't really seem scared i've seen a lot of players when i've come to games people be a little nervous kind of back off kind of just give me extra room and not really 
you know, not really want to play like that. I've seen a lot of people kind of just uh, concede things. So uh, he competes. He's not really nervous. For, and for a young person, that's good. So uh, I like his energy. I just I think he's going to he's going to help us out this year. And, uh, you know, yeah, like I said, I got us three. OK, my number three selection was the guy we already kind of discussed as well. Well, at least we mentioned him. It's Kevin Pangos. I think he was one of the best point guards that were available uh, on the market. I mean, Milan is signing signing a proven two-time All-Euroleague point guard, including first team selection. They're signing the player who made it with two different teams, both as kind of underdog teams like Jalgiris or, or Zenit. Uh, they're getting player who's coming at his peak. You know, he's 29 and he's great both at creating and at facilitating. So, I mean, that's that's that was the obvious pick uh, for Milan as soon as his situation with Ceska, you know, got stuck because he kind of reached the agreement with Ceska. He was about to come, but at the same time, the war has started. So he didn't uh, took a flight uh, to Russia. He didn't pass medicals. So formerly the contract was not officialized. So he, he kind of went to Milan as a free agent and it was a great steal for Milan, you know, just using this opportunity to, to bring him because it was the obvious pick for uh, for Eta Messina and especially when they were looking for some upgrade in point guard position with Chacho not sure about his future, either it was Real or Milan and of course Malcolm Delaney leaving the club. So huge, huge uh, upgrade for Milan team because he's a great, as I said, he's a great creator and he's that three-point specialist and that's what Milan was also missing last year. They just couldn't make shots just like Real Madrid probably. It, it was the guy who could would be a great, great fit for Real Madrid as well. He also has the Slovenian passport, but you know, maybe Milan was smarter in that specific situation. Maybe they figured out what's going on quicker than anybody else and you know, it's a good move by the management. Yeah, I agree. You hit it right on the head. Everything. I like Kevin Pangos. He's a really good player. He um only weakness he has is defensively. Uh, he's short. He's not very athletic. You know, he's kind of small, but offensively, he brings a lot to that team. And I think um, Messina will use him appropriately. And you know yeah, what's also like good. Kevin. Yeah, and you know what's also good about Kevin is that he already played with Brandon Davis uh, in Jalgiris, and they made a huge connection together. He also played with Billy Barron, another newcomer of Milan in, yeah, in Zenit. Zenit. He also knows pretty well Naz Mitrolong, who is Canadian, and they're kind of from the same area. So it also helps, you know, to make this transition in such a big team, which is aiming for, you know, title for the for the Euroleague title. They finally have to get it. So that also, you know, on top of that, it makes this signing very good for for Milan. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I'll go yeah, to number four. Need Oh, they, go ahead, I Mike. think they needed somebody. They needed somebody to create offense. I think last year in the playoffs, they they struggled to create offense. They didn't really know where to get it from, especially with Malcolm being hurt. Mostly in the playoffs, I think that's that's the area that they struggled with. So we're going to number four, right? Yeah, Eric, what you have? Yeah. Number four is one of my favorite European players, um, Nene De Colo. Um, he, he's tough. Um, He's a guy that shoots 50, 40, 90 every year. He's efficient. Um, he can create. He play pick and roll. He's good in ISO situation. Excellent off the screen, going opposite. Nice pull-up jumper. Doesn't shoot a lot of threes, but when he does shoot it, you got to respect it. Got to close out, spot up off the dribble off screens. He has that all. So, and a master of drawing fouls. So, I just like how he plays, his poise, patience. I think he's going to bring a lot to Asville. Um, he's going to really – you know, change uh, their expectation level because he's a guy that can really lift you up. He had some injuries last year in Finner, um, but they were in the mix. And I think, um, you know, even at, you know, whatever, 35 years old, he's he's a special player, and, you know, not just for his career or for the history, but right now he can still hope. Yeah, what's interesting about him that, you know, it felt like everything is going out of Asphalt and Tony Parker hands at first, you know, news broke about Vembanyama leaving the, the club for Metropolitans. Uh, some other guys were also about to leave. I mean, we knew about Okobo making a, reaching the agreement with Monaco even before the finals of the French League. Chris Jones was leaving to Valencia. I mean, it's, it feels like that, you know, everything is just collapsing in, in, in Tony's lab. 
but they, they they made these you know let's say rich moves especially for french market teams it's so hard because of this taxation to bring uh, french players and they're bringing not just french players they're bringing nando de colo one of the best french french guards in in a decade probably the pure your league legend they're also bringing joffrey laverne so i was i was surprised you know where that money is coming from so from what i've heard there was some rich investor some rich guy who decided you know to help tony to bring uh, these guys back and when i thought that you know it's gonna be uh once one team's competition in, in france i mean with monaco making all these moves now it's it's gonna be more more competitive and you know as soon as the french league will you know schedule all these finals in the end of june almost july and you know making it longer <laughs> than the nba season you never know maybe they're gonna repeat it uh, the title run <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about the schedule, yeah. Mike? <laughs> Longest season That's good, in the world. Man. That's the worst season ever, man. <laughs> so bad. Any suggestions oh, for the French play. League management about the schedule? They just need to shorten it somehow, man. We was playing one game a week when nobody else was playing. We was just still playing one game a week. We need to we need to figure out how to get two two games in a week in some weeks, especially these early weeks when we're not playing your league in September, get us two games in there. Yeah. Get us two games a week in the first two weeks real fast. Like, there's places where you can make up games and squeeze games in, and uh, I think they just don't do a good job uh, you know, monitoring that. I mean, uh, yeah, it's just too long. It's just too long of a period of time to be playing. Like, I shouldn't leave last week of August and get back the last week of June. That doesn't make no sense. Like, that's just too long to be away from home for everybody. Everybody, you need time to recover. First of all, you need to, you're supposed to have like two weeks off and then you got to ramp back up for the season. And like, if I take two weeks off, it's like second week of Ju July. So basically I get like a month to work out. I, mm -hmm. I don't even know if I can get better at anything in a month. Like, I, I at least need two months to get better at something, to work on things, you know, to make my body right for the summer, so, for the season. So I just think uh, they just need to rethink that. I mean. Yeah, just just imagine if you were playing for the national team. I mean, you would be on the oh, training camp saying. in the late of July. So it's just it's just that's awful. What, the calendar is just saying. awful. I talked to I talked to Kobo already. He was like, yeah, we don't get, I don't get there to like the 16th. I'm just like, yeah, I don't, first of all, I don't know how he's supposed to, he's coming to a new team. I don't know how he's supposed to get chemistry with us and, and fit in, especially since he's supposed to be, he's going to be a big part of our team. So I don't know how he's supposed to get comfortable and then fit in and learn personalities, learn everything. And I don't know when he rests. When does he get rest? Like, when does he, like, make sure his body is right? Does he just take those first two weeks of season off, I guess? Like, what? when does he come into the team? Like, when, is, when does this happen? So, I just think uh, the whole dynamic just needs to be looked at a little bit, just for the players' sake, too, because the offseason, I think casual fans just think we go home in the offseason and do nothing. And we just want to be on vacation. But a lot of professionals who play a long time use the offseason to get their body right, lift weights. We got a lot of nagging injuries that we had all season, knees, elbows, fingers, all type of stuff. We have to get all the way healthy, make sure our body is right. And then we would like to work on our game to get better and to like improve so we can, oh, I didn't do this very well this year. I need to work on this. So, I mean, just for a good product in general, just – for the best product for healthy players for people to get better for a better show you know a little bit more off season would be my suggestion but i don't make decisions i believe i believe cg mccollum and kevin durant has a lot of questions about the international basketball calendar right <laughs> how would you guys move you know this national team thing how would you work on the schedule i mean is there any like sample you would go for i think um maybe like Mike said, finding time to, to put double weeks in there. Um, I know it's tough, but you can find a way. A lot of your league teams would probably be upset if you do that during the domestic play, but they have enough players to where, you know, they can you know, give maybe some of the younger guys a chance or, 
you know, they have those deep rosters where you rest maybe the main guys who are on a heavy minute load and, you know, you play some of the younger ones and you might lose a game or two, but it would just make the domestic league more competitive and it would be good for um, the local leagues because local players will be forced to play more minutes, you know, so that's a, a positive of it. Um, I think uh, maybe shortening those cups or, you know, those playoff uh, series, you know, in the first round, you probably don't need a best of five, you know, or you kind of know, you know, what to expect. You can just do three, three, five and get up out of there. I think there's different ways. You don't need to play a best of seven. You know, I think uh, those, those little things can kind of speed up the process. Okay. So in the game in between in playoffs too is bad. We was taking like three games in between when we was playing Asheville. We'll play like on Monday and like Friday. It's like, all right, we need to do a day in between Monday, Wednesday, yeah. then travel, play Saturday, Monday, yeah. Wednesday. Okay. That would make that would make sense. I hope the decision makers are, you know, listening to this podcast. But anyway, getting back to our selection, my number four pick would be actually the guy we kind of also discussed in the beginning, talking about these big time scorers who are also dependent on the team they have around. And I think that now Scotty Wilbekin is in the ideal situation, you know, to show off his full potential because probably for the first time in his career, uh, he's playing next to experienced winners who are now willing to help more, you know, who are now more of a helpers and also, you know, players who are seeking for something in their careers. I'm talking about Nicolaitis. Probably it's, it's, it's hard to find a better um, backcourt pair uh, or the point guard or, or the, let's say, next ball handler next to you than Nicolaitis and also Nemanja Bielica with his shooting ability, with his playmaking ability, also helping Scotty, you know, to share this workload on the offense. And on top of that, you have Dimitri Sotoudis, um, let's say, a consistent coach for you because Wilbekin in Maccabi he went through a lot of uh, coaches a lot of heated situations and I would call it that kind of toxic environment in Maccabi I mean with all this crazy pressure from the fans from the uh, ownership it's always something going on in Tel Aviv and it's really hard to focus on basketball and I think that okay Fenerbahce is also a difficult place to play basketball but I believe that it's more about the process. And these pieces next to Scotty fits him more than in Maccabi. So still there are question marks. I think it's a big challenge for both organizations because for both sides, because for Scotty, it's his, you know, very good opportunity for him to make this A-listers tire uh, in the EuroLeague, joining, for example, Mike James and Shane Larkin as the best scorers in the EuroLeague. At the same time for Fenerbahce, you know, they also feel pressure. They are building after two very difficult seasons and especially the last one where they didn't even make the playoffs and for the budget, uh, for such a high budget team like Fenerbahce, it's a, it's a disaster. So they cannot accept any failures and it's not going to be easy. A lot of new faces. Coach, as we said, he's joining the club just after the national team competition, the Eurobasket. He's, he's with the Greek national team. It's not going to be easy. But for Scott, he probably, you know, for him being at his peak, it's a very, very good opportunity, you know, to establish himself, to leave some legacy behind him in the EuroLeague. And I'm intrigued where this move will take Fenerbahce and both uh, Scotty will begin. I think this is his year to show that, uh, just to show something different than what we've seen in Maccabi. I think uh, maybe he he can complain about sometimes uh, the structure of what was going on, like the hec hectic with the fans and the coaches. But uh, this year, probably he don't really got much excuses. This is this is the year for him to take the next step to be a leader, to be more than just a guy who uh, puts up numbers and, and affect the game in multiple ways. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how he fares with that. Obviously, we know he can shoot, he can score. Uh, it's just, you know, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing if he'll take the next step, like you said, just to see uh, how he does it and uh, how he handles being like a, on a superstar team in a superstar role. Eric, do you believe that Scottim can take them to the Final Four, for example? It's always tough when you get a new team together. Um, it's your first year assembling. 
trying to get the pieces right, not only just a new team, but a new coach. So that means for everybody, it's a new experience. So you got to have an adaption process. Um, you just got to hope that you can kind of weather the storm until things click and they will click. Sometimes it takes a month. Sometimes it takes three. Sometimes it takes to January, February, but you need to weather the storm until you finally figure out the offense, until you finally know where guys like the ball, what they like to do. I love that they paired him with Nick because it take away those playmaking duties. Um, it seems like in Maccabi, he was torn between, do I go get buckets or do I go create for my team? So you was getting like, some games you would see the explosive scoring, that some games you would see him struggling sometimes to be somebody that, you know, he wasn't. Now I think here he'll get to be himself. You know, he'll get to be a, a high scoring guard um, who can create sometimes. And having Nick there, it just alleviates that pressure. And some games it's just going to allow him to get buckets because you have probably the best passer in Europe, you know, one of the best pick and roll players there. He's going to get some spot up shots, easy opportunities. But I think, um, I don't think they're a final four team. Uh, just because there's this new, um, it's hard to get a new team together. And, and I don't know who's, you know, 1A, 2, 2A, whatever, 3A. I don't know the pecking order. You know, I think once you start to see the pieces come together, you know, you'll be okay. It had a lot of bad luck injury-wise, but they do have the pieces. Um, I think Jonathan Miley will help them. I think Devin Booker is excellent in the pick and roll. But Lisa, like, everything is kind of setting up perfectly for him to make that run. Are they capable? Are they talented? Yes. Just that first year is tough, but you know, when you have your two dish, you kind of automatically go to the final four. So if any time happens, this is the year because you know he's like a final four magnet, you know, wherever he goes. So let's yeah, finish let's finish this up. What are we? The num what number are we on? Five. Number number four, we just finished with oh, number you didn't four. Do, no. yeah, yeah, you didn't do four. Mike didn't do you it. Didn't do four. Yeah. Um my four is a double. I, mean, I, I, I couldn't make a decision, but they're on the same team, so it, count, it don't count. It's a double, but they're on the same team. And it's more about fit than actually the players. At first, I wanted to say Kalinic, just because I think that fit is perfect for him. Just the slow down, gritty, in-your-face type of basketball. That's just kind of how he plays. That's his whole thing. Uh, obviously, I don't think he's like a marquee signing or like one of the best players in your league, but I think he fits perfectly right into what Saris wants to do. Spot up jumpers, playing hard defense in your face, kind of just being who he is, kind of like the uh, the pest that he is and has been all in your league. And with that same tone, Vesely there, I think that's kind of how Saris wants to play. I think Brandon Davies wasn't exactly how Saris wants to play. I actually think he fits better in Milan just how they want to play. Uh, I think Brandon Davis will do better in Milan with the kind of, they kind of play a little bit faster sometimes. And they, uh, and I think he'll get a little bit more love from Kevin Pangos and a little bit more freedom to shoot a little bit more jumpers and be a, a little bit more dynamic. In Barcelona, I think uh, being Bessie a little bit more structured, he'll help a little bit more on defense, being taller and more athletic. If he could stay healthy, I think those two for Barcelona fit perfect with exactly what he wants to do. So I think not really as much as just like a top five best player signing, but for the fit of that team, I think that's perfect for them. Mike is cheating throughout the entire podcast, actually. But okay, I've you're the guest, the so time. yeah, I appreciate <laughs> you're it. the guest. You're the guest, so we can make some exceptions, you know. But that's a good pick. That's a good pick. Actually, I took Nikola Kalinic as one of the best under the radar signings because everybody was talking when Barca made the, all these moves with Vesely and Satoransky. Everybody was talking about them. But for me, I think that the position and the strength they lacked the most was that the small forward position. And it was the Nikola Kalinic type of player they were missing the most because what Shadas really loves is the size and the low post game. And Nikola Kalinic can both score from the low post and also create from the low post. And if you remember the, uh, the years when Jalgiris made it, surprisingly made the final four, Edgar Solano was, was a very important player uh, for Jalgiris. And Nikola Kalinic is even way better uh, presence on the low post. And he can offer a lot more like playing pick and rolls, uh, making spot up shots he has this big size for defense he's physical he's tough and really really wanted to play for barca because from at least what i've heard he took barca's offer 
which was less than 1 million euros. And from what I've heard, he even had better financial offers than that. But he just had this big desire to play for Barcelona. And at least one of my sources told that it was the only team he was about to leave Red Star for. So, you know, I think it's a great, great move for, for both sides. And he will be maybe even way more important than these two marquee signings like Vesely and Satoransky we already discussed. And, you know, taking into consideration for how much money he was signed, I just think that it it was just one of the steals of the market. But yeah. anyways, it just goes beyond the top five topics. So let's let's uh, wrap this up. Oh. Eric. My number five. For, yeah. My number five is uh, Brandon Davies. Um, I really like him. I think... Um, in an up-tempo offense, he'll be even better. He has a really nice mid-range game. Uh, he's a five-man who shoots over 80% from the free throw line. And I think what Milan has been missing is like that that kind of different type of big man that blends well. So you go in with Kyle Hines, you have that defensive-minded guy, team-oriented, does all those little nitty-gritty things, intangible things. Now you bring in Brandon Davies, you have a guy you can go to the post with. He can manufacture a bucket. He can draw the foul. He also has the ability to pass out of the post. You know that he's a good partner, as you said earlier, um, with Kevin Pangos in the pick and roll, whether it's rolling, whether that's hitting a short roll on a mid-range jumper, and he can occasionally step out and hit the three. So I think you know, you're going to see um, Brandon Davies in rare form. You're going to see him motivated, and you're going to see him thriving you know, in a place where you know, he can be 100% of who he is as a player. Yeah, I agree. I have him on my top five as well as the number five selection, one of the most versatile centers in the EuroLeague. And I think he can offer a lot more than he did in, in Barca. I mean, it was said that he was negotiating, negotiating both with Barcelona and Milan. And one of the key things why he didn't stay in Barca was that they didn't, let's say, accept his request to offer a three-year contract. And I know that Barca people were kind of surprised that he signed with Milan for two years. But to be honest, I think that he just didn't feel himself in Barcelona. And uh, even watching his body language on the court, he was just different Brandon Davis. And I, I got the same feeling like Mike did with Nick Calaitis, for example. It felt like we were just watching the different player. And he was not as good as he was seizing before the first year with Charles, but he was just killing some games. Probably you remember very well the series against Zenit St. Petersburg. He was he was incredible. So I believe that he can still mm, bring that level in Milan with Kevin Pangos, with a different coach, different environment, just a bit different uh, type of game and mentality of the team. And from all the centers, I mean, it was a big market for all the centers. Uh, I counted at least 12 teams out of 18 who were looking for starting centers. The rest of six, some of them, they were looking or at least exploring options like Nikola Milutinov. So it was a big, big market for, for, for centers in the EuroLeague. And I think that Brandon Davis was probably the best uh, center acquisition and once again, Milano did a great job by acquiring Pangos and, and, and Davis. Just perfect job in the summer. Yeah, my five is also Davis, honestly. I think uh, basically for the reasons that you guys said, and I kind of alluded to with my number four, is just that I think he's just going to fit better in that system. The only thing I really worry about with that team is at the center position, they're a little small. I mean, Kyle being the defender, he is, he's obviously short and Davies is a little, he's taller than Kyle, but he's not the biggest center. So I, I don't know how they're going to fare with a big guy, even though they don't have to play him, but like Molotinov or, or somebody taller that's seven foot, like fall from Olympiacos. So uh, I don't know how they're going to fare against bigger people like that, but obviously both of those guys are extremely quick. So on offense, they'll probably use that to their advantage and both of them, especially Kyle are, are great at defense. So I think they'll figure out a way, but I'm a little worried about height with them, but I like the sign. Yeah. It, it, now it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, funny because it seems like they're missing Terzuski type of player. You know, he just left for, yeah. for Japan mm -hmm. and he, he is that big body that they might need uh, for the upcoming year. Who knows? Maybe they're going to do some signings. True. And that's all, right? That's all with uh, yeah, our top one, five it selections. Was a long thing, it was one through five, yeah. yeah, and just let's fast track the other two topics. Uh, first of all, 
Uh, the sleepers I already mentioned, Nikola Kalinic, my best under the radar signing, who you got as some kind of sleepers in this free agency. For me, I have a Jordan and Mickey, a Bologna. I think, um, you know, he hasn't been mentioned at all. No one's really been talking about him, but he can play the four to five. Excellent shot blocker. He'll be top three shot blockers in the year elite. Um, and he's going to need to block a lot of shots because uh, he's going to have to make life easier for Milos and uh, Bellinelli, you know, for defending the rim. But you're going to see him play the short roll, posting up. He can shoot the three. Really good in the mid-range face-up game. And I think just seeing him in those pick-and-roll actions, uh, with Milos is going to be special, but also seeing him in those pin downs and a floppy action with Bellinelli, you know, I think it's going to be really good for him um, finding easy shots, but he's a good screener as well. So, you know, just a guy who's versatile. Um, he has that physicality of a five, um, but that skill set of a four. And I think people are going to really see how good he is. So it be interesting. Um, I've been going back and forth between my pick the whole time. Yeah, I'm going to say cheating. Keenan Evans. Okay. <laughs> I should cheat, but I'm going to say Keenan Evans. And I'm going to say that just because uh, I normally judge people when I play against him. And when I played against him, I felt like he was a little timid because it was his first year, but he played hard and he guarded, he guarded well. He had good athleticism. He seemed like he was figuring out how to pass working on his jumper, and I think uh, this year being in Zalgiris and getting more of a of a, of a a bigger role and having the ball a little bit more, I think uh, it'll be interesting to see if he takes another step. I think he has it. I think uh, from what I've seen when I played against him and when I watched him a lot, I think he, he can make another step, and I, it'll be interesting to see if he can put it all together because I think he has the athleticism. I think he has the drive. He's, he plays hard. He's around, and uh, he just played under Scotty, who's a, who's been around, who's scored. So playing under somebody like that all year, you get to watch, you get to take in information and be, and try to learn. So I think this will be the year for him to try to put it together and, and a team more surrounded by him and more, uh, you know, it's him as the focal point. It's actually so hard for rookie yearly point guards to enter the league and you know to be consistent to be solid because if you look back at the previous season Keenan Evans actually was probably the best point guard entering the EuroLeague and now I, I like your pick Mike because you can see how Chris Jones stepped up in in the last season after his Maccabi experience he was playing alongside the Scott Wilbekin as well he went to Asphalt and he was a very important piece together with uh, Okobo so yeah, we, we are from Lithuania, so we hope that Keenan Evans uh, will show his full potential here in Jardgeris because he will have the keys of his team. Uh, so who knows, he might be the next, uh, let's say, bloomer like just Chris Jones uh, was. Yeah, and uh, what about your league rookies to watch? Your most favorite uh, rookies to enter the league this season? Yeah, for me, it's um, a clear choice. Uh, Jonathan Motley. Um, just a beast on the interior. Uh, you yeah. get some, some percentage, Athletic. you know, promoting I mean, him entire season. So he's the clear one, right? Like he's a guy who can who can really score, who can post up, face up. He has a lot of versatility. And Atuda's liked him so much, uh, he signed him when he went to Finner. So that's clear. But the one that I think is really a sleeper that people won't pay attention to, I think is Darius Thompson. I think Basconia was lacking a lead guard who can create – who kind of plays for the team. Um, you know, he showed that he can shoot the three. Um, he's extremely athletic. He's about six, five, and he's really good on defense. Um, I think that's what people are going to see. Like he, all, he reminds me of Perry Henry, not as creative with the ball, a better shooter, more explosive. Um, and I think like, that's a, a legit sleeper that people probably, you know, kind of forgot about when they start to look at the signings, but Basconia got a really good player and he's going to make some noise. That's why teammates love you so much. I mean, you keep you just keep promoting them all the time. Hey, if you play good, good job, good job you Eric. Play, if you play good, I'm gonna tell tell the truth about you. you know, I'm gonna let them know. If you play bad, you know, I might not bow my feet, but I'm gonna just be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mike, who are your choices? Uh, for newcomer Andrew Andrews. I knew you were gonna go him. I like his game too. He's tough. He's from my hometown. 
hang out with him in the summer all the time. Really good. I think he had an explosive year this year with Bursa and what they did. Kind of like Monaco, a big sleeper. They they really did what they had to do this year. And uh, when his teammate left to Cheska, I think he got a bigger role and got to show more of his game. And I think that's just going to continue in Panna. He's been working hard this summer. I think, uh, you know, he's a versatile guy. He's kind of big. He can shoot. He can score. He can pass. He's a solid defender, I think, uh, in the right system, in Panna system. Hopefully, if he gets a chance to uh, – have the ball a little bit and be a focal point. I think he's going to be successful. Okay. Okay. As I said, it's going to be an exciting season with many interesting rookies. We have a lot of interesting transfers, which changed the whole landscape of the EuroLeague. I just have the last question for Mike, because in Player's Choice podcast, you mentioned that uh, until your experience with CSKA, you didn't play with an all EuroLeague team uh, player let's say, and that's why it was so hard for you to win titles, to get more recognition and more respect in Europe. For example, if you're GM and as a player, you have all the money in the world and you had a chance to pair up with some of these superstar players now or even before when you were playing a few years ago, who would be that guy based on your, I know, considering your personal admiration for the guy, your connection or the potential fit on the court? Somebody I haven't played with or somebody... Probably somebody yeah. I haven't played with. Yeah. Who haven't I played with that I would like to play with? You know what? I would like to play with Vesely. Honestly. Okay. Why is it like that? Miritich would be fun too, actually. Yeah, pink and pot would be deadly. What about a guard? Yeah. Or a wing? Oh, Higgins. Easy. I like Corey. I love Corey, actually. To be honest, both he could go both ways. Driver, good catch and shoot, great two way. I think Corey's one of the most underrated players in Euroleague because he uh, he can go games where he he doesn't shoot as much, doesn't have the ball as much. But if you're playing on the court with him and you're playing against him, you notice he's on the court, and you notice that he's playing good defense. He's always in the way, always in the right spots. So uh, I I hold Corey in high regard. I think people who play against him do, but I think if you don't. Uh, if you're just a casual fan, it's hard to pick up the stuff that he actually does without actually playing against him. I wish he's healthy next year uh, because I love him as much as you. I mean, he kind of hit the year league, let's say top of the year league pretty late. Uh, me too, this brought him from Gaziantep and it was kind of an underrated move. But here we are. He was very important in 2019 uh, year league title. And I think that he was that also another missing piece for Barcelona uh, last season. You remember well what he did uh, two years ago in the Final Four against Milan, making that crazy uh, game winner. So he's also very big presence in the locker room uh, as well. So I wish he's healthy next year. Are you guys, are you guys gonna follow the Eurobasket? Uh, when does it oh, start? Mm, September 1st? In September. Pretty soon. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll be I'll be in training camp by then, so I'll probably watch. Yeah. yeah I'm a, I gotta support I'll I'll support Ellie, you know, and whoever else. Is anybody else playing for my team? No, I don't think so. It's just Ellie. Yeah, I think it's just I think it's just Ellie. I think it's just Ellie. Yeah, yeah I'll support Ellie. Yeah, yeah. If you had any Demo, chance to watch Demo it, decided I mean, not to, Decided yeah. not to play. Debo don't want to play. Right. Yeah, yeah, because he didn't accept Lithuanian citizenship, so he thought that it's just worthless to go there without you. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I understand. <laughs> Maybe next summer. <laughs> yeah, if, if you just had any chance to watch the Eurobasket, I mean, you should. It's going to be a huge tournament with Doncic, Yanis, Jokic, Mithic, yeah. some Larkin as well. I mean, it's going to be one of the best Eurobasket competitions we had in the last decade. So I just I just wish it won't hurt yeah. the Euroleague season with all these head coaches, players joining their clubs in the mid of, in the end of September, actually. But, you know, we kind of got used to it in, here in Europe. So it's going to be an exciting season, not just in the Euroleague, but in the Eurobasket as well. Thanks a lot for you guys being here on the show. It was a quality time with you. I, I hope that you enjoyed it as well. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Yep. As always, it was a pleasure. 
appreciate you joining the show, Mike. It was good to get a, another perspective. We, we enjoyed your insight, man. You know your game. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, guys. And just keep us following on basketnews.com, both on the YouTube channel and our website. See you next time.